Okay, today what we want to talk about is, again, a little more about plasmas are a fluid, or at least the kind of description that we're going to use to try to describe plasmas as a fluid. So uh, let's uh, title our things here, what we're doing again, uh, plasmas as a fluid. Now, some sort of uh, general observations, let's say. Uh, let me remind you of a couple. First is that in this plasma, uh, we have two species, electrons and ions, typically electrons and protons. And so in general, we can expect that the electron temperature does not equal the ion temperature. And because of that, um, we're going to need, uh, we're usually uh, going to need two species or equations for uh, fluid equations for two species, namely electrons and ions. Now, uh, sometimes we'll be able to add them together, add electrons and ions together, and they all act as one fluid, in which case they would be, uh, we would call that magnetohydrodynamics or fluid-like or almost like Navier-Stokes equations or something like that. Okay, the second comment is, that the force field we want to consider, which will act upon uh, both ions and electrons individually, and then also on, um, on the fluid of a, of a whole sequence of them, uh, is, is from basically the electric field and the magnetic field. And of course, it is then the uh, Lorentz force. That is to say, force is equal to Q uh, e plus V cross B. And we're going to have that Lorentz force both on each individual particle and on all of the particles. And somehow, and we want to construct a fluid description, hence we put them all together and how does the whole fluid act. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we basically want to, to use the simplest fluid description we can have and for that, what we will basically do um, is to discuss, uh, and therefore we'll use density and momentum conservation equations but we will, for simplicity, uh, we will assume that there's no heat transport or entropy production on the time scale of interest. I'll be specific about this in a moment. Um, and also uh, that there's no temperature gradient or anything like that. So basically we'll set uh, T equals a constant and uh, grad T is equal to zero. And um, to emphasize, you might say, the difference from a plasma from uh, regular um, fluids, we will neglect all dissipative effects. So uh, neglect dissipative effects. These would be, you know, due to Coulomb collisions, uh, be heat flows, uh, um, various types of entropy production, ne neglect dissipative effects. Um, and so we'll be treating effectively a collisionless uh, plasma, that is to say that our frequency uh, is much great frequency for processes of interest is much greater than the collision time, and for omega you can always just think of uh, d by dt, some time uh, time derivative of uh, say the density, how fast it oscillates, how fast it changes, or something like that. And hence, on because we're neglecting dissipative effects, there will be no entropy production on the time scale of interest. Uh, this is true for most of what we talk about, um, but in some cases we will have a little bit of entropy production uh, because of various uh, processes. Namely, when we get into diffusion and resistivity. Okay, so with this uh, comment, uh, what we want to do now is talk about uh, fluid equations um, that we want to construct, I guess is the best way to say it. But before doing that, I need to give you some definitions.
in terms of a distribution function which we haven't really defined, but we won't worry about that in detail yet because we're going to get to that in kinetic theory. But I do think we need to realize what the definitions are. So basically let's uh, talk about some definitions. And it's more just realize what the quantities, that, the meaning of the quantities that I'm going to write down. So the definitions are that we'll have a distribution function, which is where are the particles located in real space, velocity space, and time at, at, at some given time. So the distribution function will be a function of x, which is spatial position, v, which is a position in velocity space, you know, vx equals something, vy equals something, and something, uh, vz equals something, and then at some particular time t. Now, the definition that I really want to get to then is what would the density be? Well, the overall density of particles would be the number per cubic centimeter, which means I'd better remove by integrating over all of the velocity, all of the velocity distribution. But in doing so, I will have just eliminated that variable, and the density will still depend on the other two variables, x and t. So I'll have that the density is a functional of x and t, and that'll be then just the integral dq of v of the distribution function f of v and t. Next, we'll have the flow velocity. And it will be the average of the distribution function with a weighting factor of the particle speed v. So it will be basically a flow velocity, v of x and t, is equal to the integral dq of v of v weighting factor and an f of x, v, and t. But now if I did that, we already know from the first equation that it's going to have the units of density. Okay, this, this, this integral here from integral dq v over f has the units of density. So if I just put in a v, I'm not going to get v, I'm going to get nv. So really to get the flow velocity, I have to in divide by the integral dq v of f of x, v, and t so that I'm getting the average of the, flow vel of the velocity within the whole distribution function. So with that in mind, uh, now that denominator is obviously n, so what people usually do is they say nv is just equal to integral dq v, v, f of x, v, and t. Now, uh, notice, and this is uh, important, and, and it's a matter of notation, but it's a physical comment. This capital V um, is the total macroscopic flow velocity of the whole fluid, okay? Little v is the, within the whole distribution of particles, it's the velocity of each individual particle. So when we speak of little v, we're speaking of a particle and what's it doing. When we speak of capital V, we're, we're speaking of the whole distribution of particles and what their average velocity is. So previously, in the last chapter, we've dealt a lot with the question of what do the individual particles do as far as moving around. Now, when we talk about a fluid, we're, we're not going to talk about that the plasma is a fluid. We're not going to talk about that individual particle velocity. We're going to talk about how the average of the whole distribution of such particles does things. So it's the average flow velocity. Finally, uh, um, another important quantity is our pressure, and its pressure, again, is a function of x and t, and it is a energy-weighted moment, but uh, it's, I write it as mv squared over 3 uh, times the distribution function f of x, v, and t, but some people might write this as, say, 2 thirds of the energy, mv squared over 2. It's 2 thirds because there's 3, three degrees of freedom and I would have kt over 2 in each direction, it turns out. Now, we will find it convenient to make this equal to nt, um, where, again, n is, you know, this density, n of x and t, and the t, uh, we're actually, as we said, going to take t is equal to a constant. So, in fact, um, we're going to have pressure is equal to a constant when we fiddle along a little bit later here. Okay, so those are our definitions, and next I just want to write down the fluid equations. <clears throat>
and then what we'll do is, is talk about them. Um, and they're relatively uh, normal fluid equations. The first one is called density conservation by some people. It's also often called just the continuity equation. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, which we call it. Um, and that has, uh, d is just dn dt plus del dot nv is equal to zero and will talk about these in a moment. Um, by the way, uh, this implies that I'm not losing or gaining any particular particles. That zero is that what the end is effectively says I'm not losing or gaining any particles. Now in a plasma, as long as I don't lose any ions or electrons, that's true. But on the other hand, if I came along and says, well, said, well, I'm ionizing some particles, I might get an ionization source of particles, or I might have a recombination uh, uh, loss uh, in there. But that would only be in a partially ionized plasma. And as I've indicated, we're mostly interested in fully ionized plasmas, so I generally won't write that down. Our next equation is then uh, momentum conservation. And here, of course, what we have in mind uh, or what we obtain is just the inertia term, mn dv dt, is equal to the Lorentz force, uh, but it's nq e plus now capital V cross B, and then minus the gradient of the pressure. And I'm going to talk about these on the next slide, but I just want to write them all down for a moment. And then finally, we have the equation of state, um, which is no entropy production, as I said. So it's d by dt of pressure uh, over rho mass to the gamma is equal to zero. Now, there is a little bit of a subtlety which I need to go into here, which is that a couple of places here I have a total time derivative, d by dt, and one place I have a partial. So I have to ask, what am I doing there? And what we're doing is we're defining effectively a convective derivative. So that, say, d by dt of, let's say, n of x and t, or, temp or anything else, would be equal to, well, since it depends upon x, and it's a fluid element, what it is is sort of is partial of x with respect, or partial with respect to t of n of x and t. And this then it gets evaluated at constant x. Um, and then it's sort of like, and this is not really right, but I just want to write it this way. It's sort of like dx dt partial with respect to x of n. And this is at constant t. But what this really is is the flow velocity v, which itself is a function of x and t. So really what this is is partial with respect to t at constant x plus v dot gradient all times n of x and t. Now, what are these terms? Well, the partial with respect to t at constant x, um, sorry, I can make that the del is a gradient, and that should be taken at constant t. So what this says is that the total rate of change of the density is equal to its partial rate of change at a constant spatial position plus how much flows out of there. So it's flow dot gradient. And so it's how much moves with the observer uh, or how much moves with the fluid, basically. So this is the, um, this is the total over here, uh, the total time rate of change. And this partial with respect to t, uh, um, at constant x is the time rate of change at a fixed point, whereas this other term, v dot del v, is the part from, um, from moving with the fluid. So this is often known as the 
uh, convective part. And therefore, that's the reason why all of this d by dt is known as the uh, convective time derivative. So it's not just right here, but as, a, as the fluid moves along. Okay, let's uh, talk about these equations just a little bit. So the first one we want to talk about is the uh, density conservation equation. And by talk about, I just mean we'll explore some properties of it so that we make sure we, um, we understand what various uh, things in there mean. So um, density conservation equation. Um, that's just dn dt plus del dot nv is equal to zero. Now, one way to kind of explore or talk about it is to uh, suppose we integrated this over some volume of a plasma. So I got some volume of a plasma here, and I just integrate over that. Well, uh, the partial with respect to t commutes with it, so what we would get is then partial with respect to t of integral d cubed x uh, over the of, um, of the density over that volume, and this would be the total number of particles within that volume. Okay, and then I'm going to put it equal to minus the integral over this other thing, which would be the integral d cubed x over that volume times the divergence of n v. But this is now we can use Gauss's law, uh, mathematical Gauss's law. The integral over a volume of the divergence of something can be converted into a surface integral, okay, dotted into the nv, which is then the number density times the flow velocity. So that's this is actually um, then the flux of particles. Um, actually, this should be we integrate over the surface that includes this volume. Okay, so you know we we get some. Uh, some plasma here, some volume we chose, and this NV, okay, is some flow rate out of that. And so what it says is the total time rate of change of the number of particles in this volume is just the negative of how many went out, okay, or the rate, I'm sorry, the rate at which they go out. So this is uh, uh, flow rate out of volume V through surface S. Um, now, so that's sort of just one observation. Now, another, ob so, so basically this just, you know, has a very fundamental uh, or simple comment that, that uh, there's nothing going on besides just a time rate of change of the density or flow out through the surface. Again, if I had a source of neutrals uh, or a loss, what I would end up doing is not having zero on the right. I'd have a creation destruction operator, source ionization or recombination or something like that. Now, however, one other thing that's uh, kind of of interest is uh, there are other ways that we can write this density conservation relation. And the way we can do that is by observing that if I have the divergence of NV, so that's the divergence of the density times the flow velocity. By the way, I should say some people write NV itself, should have mentioned, as a flux, a total particle flux gamma. Okay, but um, just depends on what you're doing sometimes in part of, uh, net transport. People will write it that way. Now, this is the divergence of a scalar times a vector, and that's an easy thing to take a... Um, uh, to take apart or, or split into parts. One part is n times the divergence of v, and the other part is uh, v dot gradient n. What does this correspond to? Well, this would correspond to what would be called compressibility, because if the plasma has compressibility, then divergence v is non-zero. I can compress it. On the other hand, this last term would be flow against a gradient. 
a gradient in the density. But the thing that I, reason why I did this is because if, or, or work this out a little bit, is because I could, this, putting this particular um, representation for del dot nv into my density conservation equation, I could also write the equation as dn dt plus n del dot v plus uh, v dot del n is equal to zero. Or I can also write it as partial of n with respect to t plus v dot del n plus n del dot v is equal to zero. But here's my, what we talked about on the last sl um, transparency or slide. We call this was the total convective derivative, right? So this was really d by dt, total derivative, of n of x and t. And so sometimes you will see the density conservation relation then written simply as dn dt, the total time rate of change of density, is equal to minus n times the divergence of v, which is just then the compressibility. So this is certainly one form of the density conservation equation. And this last one down here in the lower right is another form of the density conservation or continuity equation. Um, they have a little, they're useful in different ways. Many times we're interested in an incompressible media uh, or situation, so this last term doesn't count, and we just have dn dt is equal to zero. But this other form is more useful for this using Gauss's theorem to show, you know, there's just the, the, the time rate of change is only the flow in or out of the surface. So that was a little bit of a discussion about what the pieces of the density conservation relation are. Uh, next, we want to discuss something about the um, momentum conservation equation. So. Now, first, let's just kind of basically what we would say is a plasma is a collection of charged particles. Each of the charged particles will have a force equals mass times acceleration on it, which, of course, we always write as m dv dt is equal to the Lorentz force q is e, uh, qe plus v cross b. Roughly speaking, to get a momentum balance equation, what you do is you multiply this by the distribution function f of x v t and you integrate over all velocity space times this whole equation to average this force equation over the entire set of, of particles. So as you can imagine, having done that, so let's make that a dot so it doesn't look like another x. Um, if you do that, what you can imagine that you will easily get is mn uh, dv dt is equal to now so I just effectively converted the little v, which remember was the single particle velocity, into a macroscopic velocity, capital V. And I multiplied by density. That's how many such particles I have. Then likewise, the Lorentz force will just be NQE. Okay, so the electric field effect, it's each particle feels QE. I have N particles per cc, so I multiply by N. Then, again, we get an N V cross B because we're taking effectively the V moment there. Now, however, when you do through the right kinetic theory, there indeed is also a pressure gradient force, okay? Just because, you know, well, in the momentum balance equation, if I have an inhomogeneous pressure, I'll get a pressure gradient force. But what I want to a little bit emphasize is that really there are more terms here. Um, when I said a pressure gradient force, I implicitly was saying that the pressure was an isotropic pressure, and I could have an anisotropic pressure, in which case I would get an additional term, which is minus del dot pi, which is the anisotropic part of the stress tensor, um, or part of the pressure tensor, and I'll mention that in a moment. And then also we sometimes will introduce an M, a, a friction, so-called friction term,
the, by the friction between one species VI and one species VJ uh, of particles. And what I'm just trying to indicate by putting all that in, in yellow there, or reddish, is that uh, these are terms which we usually uh, neglect. These two terms together actually become the divergence of the pressure tensor, where the total pressure tensor is an integral dqv. And instead of doing mv squared over 2, which is a scalar, just the energy, what you do is you do a tensor mvv of the distribution function. And then what you find is it can be written as a isotropic pressure component times the identity tensor, hence the isotropic part, plus a pi, which is the anisotropic part. And so effectively, that's all I've done. Most of the time, uh, we don't care about these other two terms. Um, and so we just, I don't even write them down. Um, and maybe I should just label this last term uh, we would call collisional friction. It's the collisional friction because one species is flowing, electrons or ions, versus the other one. And so there's a momentum rate given by some collision frequency or collision time tau, collision frequency 1 over tau. So collisional frictional force. But uh, so usually all we get out of this um, is then our, our regular form here, mn uh, dv dt is equal to nqe plus v cross v. So that's the usual form we will use of the momentum balance equation. Get a little more of it on there. Okay. So now that took care of the mo momentum balance equation. The next one we want to briefly discuss is this equation of state, uh, d by dt of p over rho to the gamma equals 0, uh, which effectively says there's no entropy production uh, on the time scale of interest. So let's, um, let's see. So what we have in mind, then, uh, of course, uh, again, writing it is d, d by dt of p over rho mass to the gamma is equal to 0. Now, that's the kind of equation we can solve, right? It just says p over rho to the gamma, uh, rho mass to the gamma, is equal to some constant, which I'm going to call c, just for simplicity. And often we're interested in gradients, it turns out. Remember, we had grad p in the previous equation. So we could take just grad p would then be, uh, so we could say, well, yeah. So this equation has become now p is equal to c rho mass to the gamma. Um, and so we have grad p then would be just uh, c gamma rho mass to the minus 1, uh, or sorry, gamma minus 1 taking the derivative here, uh, times grad rho mass. But we could also write that constant C as just pressure over rho mass to the gamma. And so this becomes pressure times gamma, the you know, usual gamma factor, free, uh, there you go. equation of state factor anyway. Um, and uh, let's see, now I'm going to plug in what C is. So we get rho mass to the gamma minus 1 divided by rho mass to the gamma, all times gradient rho mass. Now I can rearrange this into then grad P over P is equal to, and this just becomes 1 over, 1 over rho mass, and so this becomes gamma grad rho mass over rho mass. And now I remember that P is equal to NT and rho mass is equal to NM, M being the mass of that particular particle and surely being a constant. But we also had that T was equal to a constant. Or we're going to specialize, I should say, to T equals constant isothermal situations. And if we do that and stick this in, then you know the left-hand side becomes grad N, 
over n is equal to gamma, and this becomes grad n over n. And so what we will be implicitly, the, the kind of description we're then using, is that we'll often take that gamma equals 1 and t equals constant, and hence we're interested or are involved in, in, a flu in our fluid descriptions in isothermal plasmas. Now, while it may be true, there's a little bit of a subtlety, and that is we will often still, even though they're isothermal, the electrons might have a different temperature than the ions. So we'll allow often Te does not equal to Ti. And how can that happen? Well, you remember we were interested in processes that were fast compared to collisions. So there's no collisions that are forcing the electrons and ions to have the same temperature. They can have some different temperature. That's uh, sort of no big deal. So um, this is then completes the, the sort of equations that we deal with. So let me sort of come back to those. And those equations are basically, again, density conservation, no sources and sinks to speak of, momentum conservation with a grad P. <laughs> yeah, we should have left minus grad P on here on our momentum conservation equation. Sorry about that. Uh, we do need that occasionally. So our momentum conservation equation, uh, mn dv dt is nq uh, e plus v cross b minus grad p, this being the Lorentz force density and this the pressure gradient force. Uh, and then our equation of state, which is effectively no entropy production and no, co no collisional effects on the time scale of interest. Question? Gamma is the same gamma we have in thermodynamics? Yes, it is. The same gamma as, as we have in thermodynamics. However, we have a kind of special case. We almost always are interested in gamma equals 1. So we'll, we're effectively taking this, uh, the special case uh, of that. Okay, now what can we do with all this? Well, uh, these equations, uh, it turns out one of the most interesting ones to deal with first is the momentum conservation equation. Density conservation doesn't tell you too much in a homogeneous plasma or something or even in homogeneous plasma. But often we're interested in so-called confined plasmas, a confined, magnetically confined plasma. A magnetically confined plasma is surely going to mean that I have a pressure gradient because I'm trying to have pressure higher someplace than someplace else to have confinement, so I've surely got to grab P. But we, want, we will want to distinguish processes that are happening, you remember, along the magnetic field is often very different from perpendicular to the magnetic field, okay? So we will want to distinguish between parallel and perpendicular processes. So what we next want to do then is consider the parallel and perpendicular uh, momentum balances. Uh, but the first one we'll consider is the perpendicular, it turns out. So consider perpendicular to be um, uh, momentum balance. And now I'm going to consider it in a kind of special case, so namely in equilibrium or alternatively frequencies low compared to the cyclotron frequency. So we're either low frequency, slow processes compared to gyration frequencies or alternatively we're going to consider pure equilibrium. So then we write down our momentum balance equation, mn dv dt. Uh, is equal to NQ uh, E plus V cross B minus gradient of pressure. Now, if I said we're interested in low frequencies or equilibrium, we're going to find it reasonable to uh, just uh, take, uh, well, take that to zero. Now, uh, what I'd really like to do is you know, I imagine that I've applied an electric field to a plasma and I've applied a pressure gradient. What I'd like to know is what's the flow in the plasma in response to that. So I'd like to solve this equation for the flow velocity consistent with some electric field and some pressure gradient. How do I solve it? Well, I could put it into components, but we're trying to do vectors, you know, in a nice, pleasant way. So if we want the you know, the perpendicular parts here, remember what we always end up doing, I said we're interested in perpendicular, is we always take B cross, okay? 
So if we do that, then we'll have 0 is equal to minus nq e cross b. It would be b cross e, but if we flip the, the order of them, of course, I'll get e cross b. I want to keep it that way. Then it turns out if you, you do a b cross v cross b, that gives you a plus sign, it turns out. And so we get an nq b squared v perp. Uh, you remember a b cross b cross v is a perpendicular part. And then minus uh, b cross gradient p. Well, in this form, I can take these two to the opposite side and just solve for v perp, namely that the perpendicular uh, flow uh, is identically, or is simply, e cross b over b squared, and then plus 1 over n q b squared times b cross gradient of pressure. Uh, is this what we would have expected uh, from, uh, from our single particle of viewpoint? Well, from single particles, you remember we had an E cross B drift for all particles. Okay? All this says is not only do all particles individually have that, but the average flow in the plasma also has that. So this is the E cross B flow now, not single particle drift, but flow. What's this other term? Well, you remember we had grad B and, and curvature drifts and things like that, but we didn't have a grad P. Okay, So this is a little something different because it's a macroscopic flow, not an individual particle motion. But So what this is called, this is actually called the diamagnetic flow. Now the way I wrote this, V perp, this is true for both ions and electrons individually, right? There. But notice that, in truth, the electrons and ions both have the same E cross B drift velocity. They drift in the same direction, the same speed, and everything. Unless, you remember, we had the finite Larmor radius effects, and then the ions, if they have big gyro radii compared to uh, wavelengths or something like that, they might drift a little slower. But generally speaking, they drift at the same rate. That means that if I ask the question, what is the perpendicular current caused by these two flows, which would be the sum over species of nj, qj, v perp j, that this is equal to 0, okay, for the um, e cross b, because all that's happening is with the e cross b, Electrons and ions are moving together, not differentially, and so in fact there's no, they produce no current. So the E cross B drift produces no current. On the other hand, how about this other term? Well, if I sum over species, I'll have 1 over NQ, okay, and there's an NQ there. The NQs cancel out, so that doesn't happen. And then I just get a 1 over B squared B cross gradient of actually pressure on the electrons plus pressure on the ions. So what we get is 1 over b squared b cross the gradient of electron pressure plus ion pressure. And sometimes people put this as total pressure p. So what we finally get out of this is that j perp is equal to gradient of pressure, total pressure, divided by b squared, and this is called the diamagnetic current, which we'll discuss why in just a moment. So, um, so now let's look at this kind of, um, how can I say, uh, geometrically, or you know, what's really going on here, or something like that. And so, uh, schematic of diamagnetic current. And I'll write it up here at the top. Namely, first I have, I just have the J is equal to B 
J perp diamagnetic is equal to B cross gradient of pressure divided by B squared. Now, our standard model of a plasma, as you'll discover as we go on, is many times that we have a cylindrical plasma. Okay? So I've got a cylinder of plasma here, which is you know, disappearing off into the distance. And if you remember, we always liked that our, you know, let me put it this way, the convention in plasma physics is that the magnetic field is in the Z direction. Okay? Now, um, if I had a confined plasma, that means, in some sense, I've got high pressure in the center and low pressure at the edge. Okay, so it's confined away from the walls. So if I make a little plot of the pressure here as a function of, of radius, it's sort of high in the center and low on the outside. So which direction is the pressure gradient, then? Well, the gradient goes from the small to the large, so our grad P is actually inward. So which direction, then, will this diamagnetic current flow in a cylinder of plasma which has its pressure highest in the center? Well, uh, it's hard for me to show up here, but if you do the good old right-handed rule okay, of, of B cross grad P, it turns out the current goes in this direction. J perp does that. Now, if you look at that direction, okay, you will discover that it will try to create a B which opposes, to the extent that there is a finite current here, a finite amount of pressure in the plasma, it will create a current which goes in this direction, which will try to create a B field going in the opposite direction to the original applied B field. So because it's in the opposite direction, that's the reason why it's called a diamagnetic current. Okay, So change in B opposite opposite in direction to uh, the, the induced by this current uh, to the applied B. Now, there's a little bit uh, more subtlety with this, though. Um, how is this current, how does it really come about? Well, to demonstrate that, I need to kind of blow up this pressure profile a little bit for you. So let's, let's just you know, expand this pressure profile here. And then what the pressure profile will look like is, let's say, something like that. Oh, by the way, A turns out to be, we usually make, you know, R for a cylindrical radius, and then A turns out to be the nomenclature people use for where the wall is. Now, we know, you remember we talked about gyro motion, and... Uh, so what happens is if I consider any one particle here, you know, it's gyrating around the field line um, like that, turns out for, for ions. Now, if I then look at a small little pillbox or, or box here of particles in here, it turns out that on the left-hand side, uh, I'm just looking at a pillbox of plasma here, on the left-hand side I've got more particles than I do on the right-hand side. So what that means is there's more particles going through the little box that way than there are um, going through the box this way. Okay. So just because of the gyro motion, okay, they're, you know, they're, they're all set on their gyro centers and doing that. But because of the gyro, if I had a homogeneous plasma, that wouldn't happen, right? because I'd have the same number of particles coming through a little box this way as coming through a little box that way, identical. However, that's not the case here. And so the net result is I get a, a current in the, in the y direction, uh, in this or y or theta, uh, which is this diamagnetic current. So the idea is that looked upon in a fluid way, What's happening is that we, uh, we, you know, in any little pill box, we got more particles going down in little box than we have going up. Now, a question that we would like to ask is then, well, how do we reconcile this fluid picture, which has a diamagnetic current, 
and the single particle picture, which had particle drifts. And the answer to that, it turns out, lies in, uh, um, well, in adding things up properly. So let's look at the total perpendicular current. And I won't go through the algebra of this because it does get a little bit tedious. But the basically what, what turns out is that the J perp diamagnetic turns out to be indeed the J drift, which would be you know, the integral over all velocity space of the drift velocities, E cross B curvature and everything else, summed over species QJ, VDJ, distribution function J. But you remember on looking on it on a single particle basis, we had that each particle had a magnetic moment, right? So there's actually plus the curl of a magnetization M, where this is the sum of the magnetic moments of each of the particles times QJ, but anyway. So this is the magnetization of the plasma because of the fact that each particle uh, you remember gyrating in its loop creates a little current and a little bit of a magnetization of the plasma. So it turns out that J perp isn't identically, you know, this fluid flow current is not identically the particle currents added up over all, uh, a particle drift induced current over all the species, but there's an additional term having to do with the magnetization. On the other hand, if I now take... Um, you, you know, often what I want to calculate is a charge buildup rate, right? And so for a charge buildup rate, I would go back to a charge continuity equation. d rho dt plus del dot j is equal to zero. Charge continuity. However, what, what is interesting about this relationship or this particular feature is that notice that while the perpendicular flow current is not equal to that just due to drifts, but there's this other term. When you take its divergence to find the net buildup, you find net charge buildup, you find that, that it is the same because there would be another term which would be the divergence of the curl of the magnetization, but that is in fact zero. So the charge buildups due to the um, inhomogeneities in a magnetic field and uh, a magnetized plasma can either be calculated then from the divergence of the macroscopic flow, macroscopic diamagnetic flow given by B cross grad P. Remember this was B cross gradient of pressure over B squared and this had in it a uh, combination of E cross B, um, grad B and uh, gradient of, um, I'm sorry, and curvature B dot del B uh, type terms. So the moral to this story is you have to be careful, okay? Um, when you're talking about macroscopic effects, you're interested in this diamagnetic current and a flow and so forth and so on. When you talk about single particles, we talk about the E cross B drifts, grad B, and B dot del B. But the net charge buildup can be calculated from the divergence of either current because the, because the, the currents are equal plus a magnetization type current.